Just a reminder again, as I reminded before worship, the prayer room is open every other Wednesday night, and tonight it's open. They left a note, as they do, the prayer room is open. Please come in for prayer. No prayer is too small or large. We're here for you. Please come in. So if you need prayer, even during the Bible study, if you're like, what's this guy talking about? I'm going to go get prayer. I don't have any idea what this dude's doing. But if you're new, if you're watching online, we study through what we call the Old Testament on Wednesday night. We started in Genesis. We're almost to the end. We're in the minor prophets, and that doesn't mean they're any less important. It just means that their writings were a lot smaller than the major prophets. And once we hit the end, we'll go back to Genesis and go through it again. So it's about eight years and you go through the entire Bible here at the church. And Sunday mornings, we're studying the New Testament. So uh, Pastor Ed's in the book of Acts. I'm in the Gospel of Luke when it's my turn. on. But uh, Old Testament, it's in a nutshell. It's the history of the people God raised up through whom his plan was always to bring salvation to the entire world. Okay, these people are just as messed up as we are. That's one of the conclusions when you look at them. They're chosen, but it doesn't mean they're better. It doesn't mean also that they're in and everybody else is out. That's not what chosen means in the Bible. You're going to heaven and all the rest of the people, I'm sorry, you're going to just go to hell. That's not what it means. It means I've chosen you to be near me, to know me, so that you can make me known to the rest of the world. And what we're seeing is here, these people that he chose, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, when they're misrepresenting God, when they're turning their back on God, that they do, like I've done. I'm prone to wander. I've been a Christian for 43 years, a missionary it was 17 years on the mission field, and I'm, it's not because I'm better than anybody, because my heart is prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Some of you are like going, I can relate to that. <laughs> One of the things that we see as we look here, and this is a picture to us of God's work in our lives. It says in the New Testament, these things were written for our learning. You know, but one of the things I see is that they survive because God is faithful. <laughs> They're messed up and God is faithful. Those are two major themes in their lives and in your life. You're messed up, but God's faithful. When they're rebelling and they're turning from God and they're turning to the idols that they were prone to turn to, God would chasten them. And this is what the prophets are announcing to God's people. He's gonna, you're going you're gonna to get chastened. It's going to hurt real bad. <laughs> you know. In the New Testament, it tells us that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You know, like, like we chastened our children. We disciplined them. Like I was disciplined and it kept me out of jail as a kid. And I could tell you some stories. But we are... In a place, the, the prophet Amos, he was a shepherd. He was not in the school of the prophets. He wasn't a theologically trained person. He was a literal sheep breeder, a shepherd. And God called him to prophesy to his people. Okay, And we've seen in the first couple chapters, God is announcing judgment against these nations around Israel in that day who had committed these unbelievable atrocities against Israel. And the judgments that Amos announced to these peoples, they've all happened in history. Okay, we come to chapter 3, and now notice what it says here. It says, Hear the word of the Lord that he's spoken against you, O children of Israel. So God's now going to speak to his own people. These words that are against you, the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. So he's going to say, now I'm going to talk to you all about the chastening that you're going to receive. 
He says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. For Israel to turn their back on their maker, the one who raised them up, and, you know, and to turn to these dead idols that they made with their own hands. This was all the more egregious in the light of the fact of the special privileged place in God's grand plan of the ages that God had given them. That's what he's conveying here in the first two verses. God is saying here, you're going to be severely chastened. Now realize, and this is important, especially right now, (laughs) what's happening globally right now. Israel is on everybody's mind, okay? He's, he's, He's a topic, Israel's a topic at the United Nations, at the International Criminal Court. He's a topic in our Congress, he's a top, Israel is the topic right now. The Jewish people, anti-Semitism, it's all over. College campuses. Here he says, hear the word of the Lord against you, O Israel. Against the whole family that I brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families. Well, we're going to look at that. What is he saying here? When God brought them up out of the land of Egypt, okay, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, Moses, right, the story of Moses, when God brought them up, it was to bring them into their own land. Okay, the original promise of the land, the land of Israel, was 4,000 years ago. God promised, and he said, I'm giving this land to Abraham and the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Now, if you and I believe, and I do, if we believe what the scripture says, I believe that God has given us his word through the prophets, through the apostles. Not everybody does. Okay, and this is one of the big things that divides people right today. This is the major difference that divides people on this issue and it divides their thinking on this issue, okay? This is one of the reasons why there's such a rise again of anti-Semitism because not everybody believes what the Bible says. But notice how many times the word land is mentioned even in Genesis chapter 12. This was the original call upon Abraham. Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, which is modern day, northern Iraq. This is where Abraham was from. And God said this to him. The Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so Abraham departed, as the Lord said, and Lot went with him, his nephew. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. And so they came to the land of Canaan, and Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. The Canaanites were then in the land, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants... I will give this land. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. I want you to notice also in Genesis chapter 13, verse 15, the next chapter in Genesis, how long the land would belong to the descendants of Abraham, according to God. Notice what it says, Genesis 13, 15, for all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. Underline the word forever. 
Okay, in Genesis 17, 8, we see God reiterating this promise of, to Abraham, adding that the land gift is irrevocable. Genesis 17, 8, the whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession. This is what the Bible teaches. Again, not everybody looks at the situation today through the lens of the Bible. I believe God has revealed himself through the prophets and in his son, Jesus Christ. I believe God has raised up the people of Israel to bring light and salvation to the world. And that's why I look at it this way. But there's a lot of people that don't look at it this way and thus there's all this chaos. It's an everlasting possession. God later repeats this promise of the land to Abraham's son Isaac in Genesis 26, verse 3 and 4. You can write that down, look it up. And then in Genesis 28, 13, he reiterates the promise again to Isaac's son Jacob, to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, the exact same promise. And then in Joshua chapter 1, verse 4, we see the extent of the land. What is he talking about? And it's actually a lot more than what Israel has right now. It's way, way bigger than from the river to the sea. You know, there's people today that want to take away from the river to the sea and God's saying it's even more than what they have now, not less or nothing. Even after they were scattered from the land into exile, and that's what Amos is, Amos, he's, he's warning them and it's going to happen. You're going to be scattered into exile. And this did happen, as Amos said. It's happened now twice in Israel's history that they were expulsed from the land. Okay, it's happened twice. But God promised, as, we, as we're going to see when we get to chapter 9 of Amos, he says, I will plant them in their land. This is after the exile. And no longer will they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 4 and 5, he says, even if you have been banished, because there's people that argue, well, that was until they were kicked out and then other people came in. And well, from God's point of view, from the word of God, if you believe the word of God, and not everybody does, and that's why there's this conflicting that's why people are talking over each other on this issue and so much passion and even hatred and yelling is happening but God says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 4 and 5 even if you've been banished to the most distant land under the heavens which happened in 70 AD Did you know that in 70 AD, a million Jews were killed? The Romans came in. They were sick of the Jews. They're, you know, resisting their occupation of Israel. That they just, Titus finally came in in 70 AD and just, they killed 1.1 million of them. And the rest of them were scattered. But there were a small remnant that stayed. There's always been a remnant, a small amount of Jews. There's always been this continual presence in that land but God says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 4 and 5 even if you've been banished to the most distant parts under heaven from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back he will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it so God's doing this God's doing this and it's causing conflict and there's There's a situation over there right now that, can you imagine? Can you imagine being, like this is your responsibility to figure out how to solve this problem? I was sitting in my office yesterday trying to help our principal solve some issues we have at our school. And I was just sitting there going, if we do this, then there's going to be, this will happen. If we do that, then this is going to happen. I was like, God, this is impossible. And God reminded me of, can you imagine if you were the prime minister of Israel? It's horrendous. And and I sympathize, you know, with both sides in this thing. 
And I'm like going, God, I'm glad I'm not. How do, how do these guys sleep at night? With the responsibility and the impossible situation to untangle all this. And I realized the problems we were trying to solve at our school, I'm like going, man, I'm a lightweight. <laughs> man, I'm overwhelmed by this. Can you imagine? Who wants to be president? These guys are nuts. They're either psychopaths or they're nuts. You know, how, it's like, can you imagine? Your decision like affects the life and death of people. I don't want that job. Like what, what kind of person wants that job? You know, how do they sleep at night? I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of narcissistic kind of like, Guys are attracted to that type of power. I don't want it, you know? So out of Egypt, God says here in verse one, verse two of Amos chapter three, out of Egypt, I brought you out of Egypt and that was to bring you into the land if you remember the story. And he finally got him into the land through Joshua. Okay? That land, which is the stage upon which all the prophecies said that the Messiah would come upon that stage, not only in his first coming. Okay, now this is why it's relevant today, but that land is the stage upon which Messiah comes again in his second coming. That's why this is the hottest piece of real estate on the planet. It's the center of all international tensions. It's crazy that this stuff is that relevant. And so we just looked at some of the verses that show how the Bible says, this land I've given to these people forever, forever. Even if they're taken out, I'm gonna bring them back. (laughs) I've given it to them. Now you might not believe the Bible and you might see the whole thing through a different lens. I understand that, okay? Even if you're a Muslim here, a Muslim with all due respect, your own Quran that came thousands of years after what God, after God even brought Abraham. You know that Muhammad was in 600, year, 600 years after Christ. But the Quran says in Surah 521 that the land of Israel belongs to the children of Israel. And did you know that there's a, there's a group of Muslims today? A significant group. That, are, that consider themselves Zionists. They're, they're saying this, the land belongs to the Jewish people because our Quran says it does. <laughs> you know, God's word says it does. The Quran says it does. And yet this is the biggest dispute. This is the biggest dispute on planet earth right now. By the way, for those who hold to the heresy of replacement theology, there's, there's Christians, this is a Christian theology that became, that took root in the, uh, in the, what we call the Reformation 500 years ago. So 1500 years after Christ, there, was, there became this teaching because the Jewish people had been exiled from their land at that point for about 1500 years and there was a lot of people that read the bible 500 years ago that were like going it can't this these things can't be talking about the literal jewish people and the literal nation of israel because it hasn't been there for 1500 years and so they said the church has replaced the jewish people the nation of israel There were some reformers, there were some before the Zionist movement began over a hundred years ago where Jews, this miracle, this thing that's never happened in the history of the world where people have been displaced and millions have returned and a nation has been reborn and a language has been revived and it's prospering in such a short period of time. Nothing's like this has ever happened. And there were Spurgeon, for instance, Spurgeon, before this even started, he was looking at the Bible going, no, it says that they're going to be regathered. The nation will be birthed again. And I have total respect for Spurgeon. He believes the Bible. He believed that, and he said it even before there was any evidence of it happening. 
But a lot of the reformers, they believed this replacement theology that says God is finished with Israel, with the Jewish people. Have you ever read Romans 9, 10, and 11? Romans 9, 10, 11, all it says is that he's, there's no way that he's finished with them. Even them that, did, that, that rejected him, that were cut off, that were cast away, he says he's not done with them. And you know what? If God's done with the people that he's made these promises to, how do you know he's not going to change his mind on all the promises he's given to us? It's a catch-22. But he's not done. He'll never be done. The nation of Israel, the, pe- the Jewish people are in the plan of God in our future, in the second coming of Christ. And as God is faithful to what he said to them, he's going to be faithful to what he, everything he says to us. Because God is faithful. He doesn't lie. He keeps his promises. Even when we can't see it. Even when we're like going, this can't mean this. It does mean that. You're looking at it from a human perspective. How can this be? God's like going from his perspective, it's no problem for me. How can this be? It's no problem for me. And that's some of, your, some of us have this problem. We look at all of life through this. How can this be? And God's like going, you need to look through my eyes. It's no problem for me. Okay, it's a difference between walking in your own understanding and being a person that walks by faith. Faith means you live off of the word of God. And thus you're at peace. Thus you have hope. Thus you see what God's going to do before it even happens. Okay. Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 35, you can read this. God has given his word that the nation of Israel will never cease as long as the sun still shines and the moon and the stars shine by night. And last night I looked up and the stars were still burning and today the sun, I got a little sunburn sitting out on this patio this afternoon. But right after promising to make a new covenant, by the way, this kind of twists some Christian minds. <laughs> Did you know that the new covenant is with the house of Israel and with the people of Judah? That's what Jeremiah said. Behold, there comes the day, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now that's a Christian thing. That's our thing. That's our Gentile thing. We're Christians. No, it says, Jeremiah said, there comes a day when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the people of Judah. Now as Gentile believers... In Israel's Messiah, which is what you are if you claim to be a Christian. Isn't that weird? We're Gentile believers in Israel's Messiah. Partakers of the new covenant. We've been grafted in. We're full-fledged citizens of God's people. We've been brought into the family of God. And the New Testament calls us chosen in him. The, this, the Bible calls the Jewish people chosen, just chosen, unqualified. It calls Christians. Every time it calls us chosen in the New Testament, it says you're chosen in him because we've been grafted in. And it says to Gentile believers in Israel's Messiah, be respectful of the of the, the trunk of this tree that you've been grafted in as a wild olive branch. Read it in Romans 11. It says, don't be haughty, but be respectful because you don't support the root. The root supports you. Okay? So for Christians to get all snooty, like this replacement theology, Paul rebuked that mentality in Romans chapter 11 that it keeps springing up there's a respect this is, God, this is what God's doing this is how God's doing it but Jeremiah 31 35 thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day the ordinance of the moon and the stars by night who disturbs the sea the waves roar the Lord of hosts is his name if those ordinances depart from me the laws of physics 
if the laws of physics cease to be in action, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Okay, thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, can you measure the heavens above? You can't even imagine where it ends. If we were in a spaceship right here, if this is a spaceship, we're going a trillion lights, light years per second. Let's say we go a trillion years. Are you ever going to reach the edge of space? Someone would ruin the whole thing and say, you come to a wall that says the edge of space. Then Doug would ruin the thing. He'd raise his hand and say, what's just up beyond that wall? We can't even imagine where it ends. God says, if you could measure where the universe ends, he says here, if you can go down into the very core of the earth, you know, we, we, dr- we drill deep into the earth crust, but we, th- to get all the way to the center of the earth, he says, then I will cast off the seed of Israel for all that they've done. Then I will forsake these people who are as jacked up as you are. If you can measure the heavens, and you know what? God says the same thing about you. <laughs> God says the same, this is how secure we are in his love. What we see, how God treats Israel, his faithfulness to Israel, even though they're so messed up. He looks at you and goes, you're just as messed up and I'm not gonna ever leave you. I'm never ever gonna leave you nor forsake you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. You know what some of the most insecure Christians are? Those Christians that believe that God has reneged on all of his promises to Israel. Because now we're the chosen. We're the chosen. No, we're chosen in him, in Israel's Messiah. They're still chosen because he doesn't unchoose who he chose. But these people, these replacement theology folks, they're the most insecure Christians ever. Their writings and their journals are plagued with torment of insecurity and no assurance. Yeah, because your God forsakes his own promises. My God, the God of the Bible doesn't. He does not renege on his promises. He is faithful no matter what. He says, if you can measure the heavens and go down to the center of the earth, then I will forsake the people of Israel for all that they've done. They're as messed up as us and God hasn't forsaken them. So what is it? What is God saying here in Amos to Israel at this time in their history, in Amos' day? He's saying, I've showed you such specific care and provision. I've chosen you. And you've turned your back on me to these dead idols. This this is an outrageous offense, is what he's saying. Against this high privilege I've given you, this love that I've shown you, and whom the Lord loves, he's going to chasten. And thus Amos' prophecy, hear the word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up from the land of Egypt. You only have I known. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. What is that? He's saying to them, you're the only people in the unique category of my chosen people, chosen for the the purpose of bringing my light and salvation to the world, blessing to all families of the earth. You're the only people that have that distinct calling on you. And so for you to turn and so misrepresent me, I'm going to chasten you, severely chasten you. (laughs) That's what he's saying here. 
And if you think about it, it's through these people that we have our entire Bible. It's through these people that Christ came, Jesus, the first words of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay? And it's to that land, it, 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 Jesus came through that, these people, and it's to that land and among those people that he's coming again. That's why this is all relevant still today. You can read about it in Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12 describes what's forming right now around Israel. God says, in that day, all nations of the world will surround Israel. Israel to destroy her. And I, God says, I'm gonna, I will pour out in those days my spirit upon the house of David and on the, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Listen to this, Old Testament Yahweh, God the Father speaking. He says, that they will read it in Zechariah 12. The people of Israel will look upon me, God says, whom they've pierced. And they will mourn for him. Even the, even the grammatical structure of it is like, what? They'll look at me, God saying, and mourn for him, the one that they've pierced. They're going to recognize. All Israel is going to look and go, we crucified our Messiah. And they'll mourn in repentance. They're going to mourn and there's going to be a mass conversion. But it's going to be at this time where the whole world is against them. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Wow. God is saying in essence here, for you to turn from me to lies. That's what idols are. Isaiah chapter 44, read all about it. God says, as they, God, Isaiah says, is that not a lie that's in your hand as they're holding their idol? It's a lie. God has called Israel to, to, to know him in truth as God reveals himself to them. And they're embracing lies. God's like going, no, my calling on you is to know the truth and make the truth known to the whole world so everybody can be free. And you've turned to lies. You're going to get spanked really bad, really hard, is what he's saying. And now in, in, in embracing your idols, you now misrepresent me by the way you're treating each other, using and abusing each other, exploiting the vulnerable, allowing injustice. The, God hates all that stuff. And Israel was meant to show forth the way of God. I'm going to severely chasten you. I'm going to send you into exile. This was the message of the prophets. Okay, I'm going I'm to evacuate you out of the land and I'm going to cleanse my land of all your lies, all your idols. And this happened. And I'm going to bring you back. <laughs> I'm going to bring you back. And if Israel thought that their standing as a specially chosen nation made them less responsible before God, they were greatly mistaken. Okay. So next, Amos connects six statements to a seventh statement to make a point. This is what he's going to do here. He's going to connect six statements, rhetorical statements, where the answer is obvious to make a final point, okay? That's what's happening. So he says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? And everyone said no. Obviously, no. Two can't walk together without having first made an appointment to set a place and a time to meet, and then they can walk together. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? No, lions don't randomly roar, but they roar to ward off rivals or someone who's coming to steal their prey. Roar, you know, stay away. Will a young lion cry out of his den when he's caught nothing? No. My dog growls at my... my our little terrier growls at our poodle because the poodle will come up when my little terrier has got the bone and he's saying, get away, this is mine, you know? 
Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth when there's no trap set for it? No, of course not. Birds don't randomly fall into traps. They get trapped in baited snares. And in the same way, Amos asks, will a snare spring forth from the earth when it's caught nothing at all? No, if a trap springs, something triggered it. If a trumpet is blown in the city, will not the people be afraid? And everybody said, yeah, they will be afraid because trumpets in the ancient world were used to rally people because there was danger and it was time to unite together to go to battle against an enemy. And then Amos brings these six statements together to make a point in a seventh statement that applies to Israel. And he says, here it is. Here's what he's been building with all of these rhetorical questions. If there is calamity in the city, will not the Lord have done it? In other words, when judgment comes on the cities of Israel... Everybody should know that the Lord has done it. It won't be an accident. It won't be fate or bad luck. It will be the severe chastening of the Lord, of the nation that he loves, that he's chosen, that has this unique calling upon it. Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servant, the prophets. In the context of this passage here, verse seven, is, the, is, is this announcing to Israel of this judgment that's gonna come by the hand of the Assyrians. And all the prophets were warning. He's saying, God, God's telling you in advance that this is coming. And he concludes by saying, a lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? And this is what we call a parallel. So it's a poetic form he's using here, suggesting here that the lion is the Lord. Amos is saying the Lord has roared like a lion, announcing the judgment that's coming. And since the Lord had clearly revealed what he was about to do, this, like my mom would clearly signal me, go to your room. I, I knew, oh, that's it, it's over. My mom did the, I'm gonna, own, I'm gonna I'm, I'm, it was the three, I got the three warnings. I don't, I don't, we, I don't know about that, but, but man, when she finally said, go to your room, it was like, okay, the lion has roared. I'm going to get a spanking. And then she would let me sit in there for 10 minutes. And I was just to prepare myself, you know. Here he's, Amos is communicating, the Lord is clearly revealed. There's gonna be this severe consequence. And Amos is saying, he's saying, the Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? In other words, don't blame me when this happens. I'm only the messenger. You know, he's saying as natural as it is for a man to fear when a lion roars. That's how natural it is for a prophet to prophesy when the Lord has spoken. That's what he's saying. He's just, he's just, he's just letting them in on, I'm just a man and I'm just bringing the message. Don't blame me. I'm just the messenger. And so the message of judgment against Israel Notice, it goes to the surrounding nations. God tells Amos, I want you to tell the nations around. He he uses here Ashdod. Proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod. Ashdod was one of the city-states of the Philistines, right there next to Israel. In the palaces of the land of Egypt, I want you to proclaim that I'm going to be chastening my chosen people. Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. Okay, this was the capital of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. I want you to announce to the nations around and I want them to assemble in the capital city of my people. And I want them to see the tumults in her midst and the oppressed within her. I want the nations to take a look at what you've been doing to each other as you're worshiping your idols For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. 
God says, I'm gonna, I want the nations to come and take a look what you've been doing. I want them to see what you've been doing so they understand when I'm chasing you what this is all about. Because being chosen means it's more than just about you. God chooses them to know God, to make God known to everybody because God so loves the world, you see. Now, this is very interesting, okay? God inviting the nations in here, represented by Ashdod of the Philistines and the nations of Egypt, come into Samaria, the capital city of the northern tribes of my people, so that they can see what you're doing. So they understand when I spank you, I chasten you, what's going on. Being chosen of God, God will make himself known through them, follow this, either by them walking with the Lord and the people seeing the beauty of God's ways and going, I want, I want some of that. Or, or by them living totally for themselves and then watching God chasten them. Either way, God is glorified and God is known, okay? The one option is by showing the beauty of God working in and through them. The other option is to show how ugly and unacceptable this is to God as God chastens them. Okay, the one way to make God known is a way of blessing and peace and joy. The other way is a very painful and miserable path. Okay? Notice he says here, I want the nations to come in and see how you're rich in their palaces, how they, by violence and robbery, become rich. This is unacceptable to God. People that become wealthy by oppressing other people or by ripping them off. Okay? God says, come on in, everybody, watch this. When I got spanked, it was in private. Okay, my mom said, go go to your room. I appreciated that. She didn't spank me in front of my friends or the neighbors, you know. But here God's inviting the neighbors in. I want you to see what they've been doing and that this is unacceptable to me. Because I'm going to make myself known through these people one way or the other, okay. Again, chosen doesn't mean you're in and everybody else is out. You're going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell. It means you're the people that I'm going to make myself known to through the world, which means if you're misrepresenting me, you're going to feel some pain. You're going to, until you drop your idols and you get back to my truth. Chosen is for the purpose of knowing God and making him known. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God will either use his chosen to make him known by them walking in God's way, as we said. The nation's looking and going, wow, this is beautiful. Or as he chastens his people for the evil that they're doing. How do you, as chosen ones in him, in Christ, how do you want to be used by God? This is a big question. How do you want to be known how do, you want to, how do you want to be used of God? Remember back in Solomon's day, King Solomon? The nation of Israel was prospering. There was zero unemployment. They were completely at peace with all their neighbors because of the wisdom that God gave to Solomon. The queen of Sheba Many people believe that Sheba, the, the Sheba was the area of, you know, down Eritrea, the, the, the modern day area of Eritrea, the Ethiopian area. These beautiful, noble, have you ever seen an Ethiopian person? They're just this beautiful, noble looking people. The queen of Sheba heard about the kingdom of Israel in Solomon's day and said, we got to go check this out a nation that every, there's no unemployment. There's total peace with all their neighbors. Everybody has prosperity. She came, she brought this entourage up to see the wisdom of Solomon. 
this is how we want to be used of God. This is how I want to be used of God because I'm applying the word of God and my life is working, okay? She came and she, she brought Judaism back to Ethiopia. When the nation of Israel was reborn in 1948, the biggest airlift in human history was out of Ethiopia. There was all these Ethiopian Jews. You walk around the streets of Jerusalem today, every 10th person is black. They're Jewish Ethiopians. How did Judaism get down into Ethiopia? The Queen of Sheba took it back and said, we are going to serve the God of Israel. (laughs) And it's just, it's an amazing thing to look at in history. Wisdom, by the way, is not a bunch of words, okay? Wisdom is, when, when there's wisdom in someone's life, their life works. Their relationships work. Their families work. When wisdom is in a community, the community works. The nation works. A lot of smart people, you know, philosophers, guys with PhDs and philosophies who can talk big, you know, and argue people down into the ground about life. A lot of them are total fools. How do I, why do I think that? Because their lives are in shambles. Their, their marriages are continually not working. Their finances are a total mess. The relationships are just not functioning. That wisdom, when wisdom is applied, the, the, your life works, okay? I don't want to be a smart guy. I want to be wise, a wise guy. Some people have said, you are a wise guy, you know? Just because you can regurgitate a bunch of knowledge, if your life is a total mess, if financially you're always in the hole, Relationally, things are always full of strife and failed relationships. You know, you might be able to spout knowledge that you've read, but by definition, you're a fool. You're a smart fool because knowledge and wisdom are two separate things. Okay, here the nations of the world are invited in to see not how Israel at this time is working, but how their rebellion has led to total chaos and total misery. God's saying, I want you to get a good look at this so that when I I chasten them, you understand. God is using Israel, even in this condition, for his glory that the nations seeing how ugly things have become will witness and go, whoa, we don't want to do what they're doing. So he'll use us either by people looking and going, I don't want to do like he's doing, or they'll look and go, I want some of that. (laughs) You know, look at what are you doing? What are you doing that your life works? What makes you tick, you know? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land and shall sap your strength from you and your palaces will be plundered. This was fulfilled, what Amos Amos is saying here, this was fulfilled when the Assyrians invaded Israel less than 30 years after Amos spoke these words. This is historical. Not only recorded in the Bible, but archaeologists have dug up these Assyrian cuneiforms and and these things are all recorded in the Bible and outside of the Bible. For 10 years, Israel was subject, a subject state to the Assyrian Empire. And then finally, they came in and took them all into captivity. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs and a piece of an ear, so the children of Israel shall be taken out who dwell in Samaria, in the capital city where their idolatry, the capital of their idolatry, in the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. What is that? There's a guy, a commentator named Hubbard who had the best explanation. He says, Amos here, Amos's comparison then makes the sarcastic point here in verse 12 that when the invasion strikes, 
Israel's devastation will be so complete that all that will be rescued is proof of death in the form of scraps of furniture, the pieces of a bed in the corner of a couch. And so the children of Israel will be taken out who dwell in Samaria, exiled in the corner of a bed on the edge of a couch. This was fulfilled. This part was fulfilled in the Assyrian exile when they took them out less than 40 years after Amos uttered these words. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel. This speaking of the pagan altars that God's chosen people as they turn their back on the worship of God at the temple in Jerusalem, and they made these idols, God says, I'm going to visit destruction on the altars of, on your pagan altars, on your idolatrous altars, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. When we turn to idols and we build shrines to our idols, we invite God to come in and tear them down, okay? So don't waste your time building them up because God will come in and tear it all down. And this is the kind of the story of many people's lives. They're, they build this altar to their idol. They're not relying on God and, the, and their life is one pile of rubble after another. Even Christians, God's saying, Build your life on my word. Seek first my kingdom and I'll build your life up. Okay? I will destroy the winter house. Let's finish this here. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish. The great houses shall have an end. And so what God is saying here in this last verse, he's speaking about the houses that the wealthy in Israel had built by their oppressing of the poor and their robbing people by exploitation. He says, I'm going to take them all down. The win- you, you got your winter house and your summer house. You got your house of ivory. You've got your great mansions that you've built, but you've built it all by oppressing others, by robbing people. God says, I'm going to take it all down. I'm going to tear it all down. But what's amazing is he's not going to forsake these people. What's amazing is that God's chosen people can can wander this far from God. That we can get caught up to this degree. What a trip. (laughs) Okay, what a trip. There's Amos chapter 3. I'm done. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, help us to digest all this. We thank you, God, that you've raised up a people and you've brought forth a savior and that because of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Lord, that we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We're in your favor. Lord, help us to build our lives on your word like the wise man who hears the word and built He put it into practice. So when the storms of life come, and they're going to come, every house is going to, the waves are going to be, Lord, that our house would stand. Lord, let us not be like the foolish one who knows the word but never applies it. When the waves came and the storm hit the house, it fell. Lord, we thank you that even, even if everything we built is taken down, that you won't forsake us. Lord, we cry out to you, Lord, in, our, in, in the middle of this world situation, Lord. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come, that you would come quickly, Lord. That you'd help us to, to keep centered in your heart. Lord, your heart is for all people of the world. You so loved the world that you brought forth your son. Keep us centered, especially in this year of election when 
all the issues are thrown at us and there's strategy to divide us and to turn us against each other. Lord, may we not be caught up in the war, the, the wars of this world. May we be caught up in you. May we be busy about your business, even as the world goes crazy. We ask this, Father, for your glory and our greater joy. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said together, amen. Hey, blessings on you. Say hi to someone on your way out. Maybe get a name, fist bump, a hug, whatever you do. See you next time. Amos chapter 4.